morning, everybody. Why don't you guys stand with us as we open up? God, I thank you that we woke up this morning. I thank you for the cooler weather outside. God, I thank you that you are looking upon us right now, that you are with us and present with us, and that you love us. And I pray that our hearts this morning would come to accept that. God, that we would accept that we are loved by you. May your heart be moved, God, this morning. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts and full like flowers before you, hoping to the sun.
seated, but stay in an attitude of prayer if you would, and let's, let's kind of turn that praise into a prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, you certainly are worthy this morning of our praise and our honor and our devotion and our reverence this morning for all that you are in your character of mercy and justice and strength and compassion, your love, your power, your sovereign control of all things. You deserve our praise and we do offer that to you this morning. And as we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving this week, Heavenly Father, we are also mindful of all the things that you've done for us, ways that you've been faithful through the years. You came through for us in our, our time of need. Just the blessings that you shower on us with friends and with family. You take care of our physical needs. You provide relationships for us that are satisfying and so meaningful. You've given us the gift of a spiritual community, our, our church family. And all the ways that we're blessed by our brothers and our sisters. You've given opportunity upon opportunity. You give us purpose. You give us meaning. You give us life and breath. And most of all, you gave us Jesus. You have secured our salvation with sacrificial love. And this morning, we are very grateful for that. We're mindful, even as we sing and we say that with, with this breath in our lungs has been given to us by you and the privilege of singing to you has been given to us because Jesus took the place of people like us so that we could be forgiven and adopted and we could be your children and we could come and celebrate you this morning. So that's what we do. We offer you our thanks and our praise this morning. You are worthy. But Lord, we also know that as we go into this week that there are many people for whom this will be a bittersweet week. Either because they've lost someone they loved, facing a financial burden or challenge, maybe there's disunity in families, broken relationships, maybe it's addiction, lots of reasons why this may be a painful, hard holiday to celebrate. And so, Lord, in these just these few seconds together, we ask that you would hear each of us as we offer up the names of the people that we know that this is going to be a tough week for. So, Father, we are entrusting um, these people that we love to you, and we ask that uh, you would be for them all that they need you to be, that this, uh, even though it may be bittersweet, we pray that they would have a sense of your presence, of your purpose, of your hope, and of your love for them, and that you would use us to be um, people who embody and express that love in a very practical way so that you would be honored and glorified as we give thanks for all the blessings and the good things that you've given us and done for us. Uh, we want you to get all the glory, and we want to be used by you so that that um, love and that kindness could be contagious and could be expressed to others. So we pray that you would use us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome. It is uh, good to have you here this morning. Uh, like nobody wants to sit up here, not sure, sure what that's all about. It's not like the splash zone at SeaWorld. Um, so I'll just sit up here by myself, that's fine, no big deal. Um, but good that you're here. If you're streaming with us online, always uh, a privilege to have people stay connected with us uh, through our uh, online streaming. Um, you can also always go back, by the way, because the the services are live streamed, but then they're archived. And so if you ever miss a week and you didn't catch it live, you can always go back and, and kind of stay with different sermon series that we're on or something. If you always want to stay caught up, you can do that. Um, if you are a guest or a first-time visitor this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. 
Um, the one thing we do ask, if you are a guest or a first-time visitor, if you'll take just a minute and fill out the information slip that's in your worship guide, and you can either put that in the offering, or you can take that after the service out those doors to the information table, and they'll exchange that with a gift bag with some information about our church and things that are happening. If you're looking for a place to belong or considering uh, our church as maybe a church home, that'll have some information that you uh, can check out uh, in there. Um, there are lots of things that are happening. I'm just going to encourage you to um, check out your bulletin. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's several events, especially as we head into the holiday season, uh, meaningful opportunities to, um, to worship, to be together with the family of God, but also so many opportunities to serve um, and to um, kind of be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community through some of the season of uh, um, service opportunities that are in the Welcome Center. So stay connected, pay attention to what's going on, and try to be as involved as you can as we head into a, what I know is a very busy season. So you may just have to pick a few things that you think you can do, uh, and, do and be a part of, but, but do check all that out. Um, one of the things you may have noticed, if you stopped by the church this week at all, you would have noticed this very busy, this side of the building was very busy because we are a drop-off location for Operation Christmas Child. So many of you and many of your children have been putting together these shoe boxes uh, that are then sent around the world um, to children in need who probably in no other way would have um, a Christmas present or something. And so these boxes are filled with all kinds of goodies for kids. Uh, that are then sent around the world. And so we've been participating and putting together shoe boxes, but we're a drop-off center uh, for other people in the Lakeland community to do that. And so this has been a hub of, of busyness this week as we've been doing that. And so we always want to pray uh, before these boxes are shipped out. We want to pray that uh, they, they're not just boxes, but that they are expressions of God's love for the kids who open them. Um, and we also want to give thanks for God's generosity through us. And so uh, I'm going to invite Joe and the kids to come up. They have um, just a sampling of those boxes. Uh, and as they come up, I'm also going to invite up Ian Cook and a couple other representatives from, um, uh, from the Operation Christmas Child Organization. They would like to make a presentation to our church as well. Ten years ago, on Monday, the 12th of November, 2007, First Presbyterian began its first day as a, a drop-off location for Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes. Monday, the 12th, was a, was a busy day. I know it was a busy day because I was here. It, it was my very first day as a volunteer with Operation Christmas Child. I had no idea that ten years later I'd be standing here with you good folks and uh, a ten-year recognition certificate. When First Presbyterian opened as a, an Operation Christmas Child drop-off location, it was only the second location here in Polk County. Since then, God has blessed us with enormous growth in both shoeboxes and in drop-off locations. And uh, today I can tell you that, that First Presbyterian is just one of nine drop-off locations in Polk County. Under the leadership of Nancy Bertram, First Presbyterian has grown in the number of shoeboxes collected has been a, a consistent and faithful partner with Samaritan's Purse in the Operation Christmas Child Project. Many of you folks have, have volunteered your time and your energy to the essential tasks of collecting, counting, and cartonizing those shoeboxes, as well as providing Christian hospitality and a missional drop-off experience to each and every donor that has brought a shoebox here. So on behalf of the Many thousands, yes, literally many thousands of children who have received one of those little oblong gospel opportunities, otherwise known as shoeboxes. I'm here today to say thank you. It's my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Bob and Gloria Bedford. Uh, Bob and Gloria are the area team network coordinators here in Polk County. They've worked tirelessly to build the uh, shoebox drop-off network here. And uh, they're now going to present the, uh, the 10-year certificate uh, to Pastor Kenny. Awesome. 
you. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, before you guys step away, actually, we'd like to offer a prayer for these boxes and also your team as you guys are doing great work. And we are, it's been our privilege to be a part of this. Um, and I know it's kind of the, it seems like the Christian bumper sticker thing to say, um, even though it's something that Jesus said, that it is more blessed to give than to receive, but it really is. Uh, our, our kids get excited about it. Our volunteers are glad to show up all week because they know this is going all around the world. And I love the oblong gospel opportunity that we call a shoebox because that's what we hope. And that's our prayer, and that's why we participate and believe in what you do, and thank you for including us. Um, let's, let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this day for your love for us and your love for this whole world. As much as we love our kids and, and we always have fun kind of celebrating them, uh, we know this world is full of kids, children around the world who don't have the kind of privileges and opportunities that we have. And so um, we just ask that... Uh, these expressions of generosity would become, in fact, little gospel presentations so that as kids around the world open up these boxes, that they would be, I'm sure they'll be fascinated by the colors and the toys and the pencils and all the things they're going to get. But I pray that as they sit back and reflect, that you would use them also as a way of expressing your great love for them, that would soften their hearts to be open to the gospel so that when it's presented, They'll have a tangible reminder, a memory in their mind of when you took care of them uh, and offered your love in a very practical way. And so um, I thank you for uh, Ian and Bob and Gloria. Thank you for their ministry and thank you for um, the larger ministry and just ask that it would continue to grow so that more and more lives could be touched by your grace and your kindness. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as they're being dismissed, everybody else can stand and let's maybe say hello to the people around you. Thank you, guys. You guys come back and join us here.
where this is the last Sunday of our um, faith commitment, uh, Stewardship Sunday commitments. And so uh, every year, if you're a guest this morning, just so you kind of know, um, our church family goes through a process where each of us who feels like this is home and we believe in our mission and we believe in our life together, um, we kind of prayerfully consider what it is we might give financially to support the mission of our church in the next year. And so for the last three weeks, we've been going through that process, and then we have a commitment card where people kind of say, uh, assuming uh, our financial picture doesn't change, this is what by faith we are committing to give. And that kind of helps us plan and prepare uh, and kind of know how best to use the resources that we're going to have for our mission and our life together in the coming year. So that's what we're doing, the offering boxes this week. So if you have a prayer slip or uh, one of the information slips that you want to turn in, if you just have a regular offering or tithe, um, or if you have one of the commitment cards uh, for any and all of those things, uh, after I say a prayer, you can come up and use the uh, offering boxes to turn those in this morning. So let's, let's pray before we do that. Heavenly Father, um, your mercy is enormous for us. Just as we've sung in that song, though our sins are many, your mercy is always more. Your generosity always is more than ours. And we've experienced that generosity in so many different ways. The most profound way is through the giving of your son, Jesus. And so we want to be people who are motivated by grace and by love and compelled by your generosity to be open-handed and to consider it a privilege. Part of the adventure of following you to give financially and to use our resources to further your mission. So I pray that you would use the resources, the gifts, the offering, the commitments that we make today, um, as that you'd receive it as an act of worship, but also that you would give us great wisdom and generosity as we then use these resources in our community and around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So go ahead, if you have one of those, you want to come forward and put those in the boxes. All right. So over this past um, summer, we uh, were, had this awesome opportunity. A friend of ours who has a beach house in Anna Maria Island offered for us to stay there for a week. It was going to be vacant, and they offered it to us. And so we, of course, took them up on that. And um, we had an awesome week there. We love, our family loves the beach. I love to fish. And um, so we had a great week. Um, so it gets to be Saturday, and it's the last day that we're going to be there. And <clears throat> about mid-morning, we're kind of packing up, and Cooper says, hey, Dad, can we go to the donut experiment one last time before we leave? And the donut experiment is this awesome donut shop. It's kind of like you go through, like, Subway, and you pick all the unhealthy stuff you're going to put on the donut, um, and you kind of personalize your uh, lack of restraint. But anyway, so it's this awesome place. We love it. And, uh, and so I was like, yeah, of course, of course we'll go to the donut experiment the last day before we leave. And he says, well, could we take the golf cart um, instead of your truck. I was like, yeah, that's fine. We'd kind of been driving the golf cart all week long. And, um, and he says, and can I drive? I was like, whatever, dude, that's fine. So, because all week long, we had seen all these other people driving golf carts, people of all ages, young and old, whatever. So we, he gets in, we're driving the golf cart, and um, we get onto the main drag, and immediately this truck pulls up behind us, and it's like riding our tail, really aggressive. And I said, but I said, just pull over into the bike lane and let this, uh, this person created in the image of God buy. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what I said. He, but um, anyway, so I said, let this guy buy, and, um, and, uh, and then that'll be safer, and then we'll get back. Well, as soon as we pull over into the bike lane, the truck does pass. 
but the sheriff's ATV, this, the sheriff in an ATV, a beach ATV, flips his lights and pulls him behind us. Seriously? So, um, so we pull over, and the guy comes up, and he's all, like, intense and serious, and, um, you know, and he's like, what, can I ask you why you're driving in the bike lane? I was like, well, there's this truck, and it's aggressive, I'm not, you know, I just thought it'd be safer to get out of the way. And he says, well, you can't drive a motor vehicle in the bike lane. You know, now, the gift of sarcasm that I have, I had to pull that back, because my thought was, you know it's a golf cart, right, dude? Like, you keep calling it a motor vehicle, it's a golf cart. But anyways, I didn't say that. I said, well, I said, I, I didn't realize that. I said, I just thought it'd be safer to get out of the way. And he says, well, no, it wouldn't be. That's a, that's a the moving violation. And he says to Cooper, he says, and son, how old are you? Cooper says, 13. Now, see, how did y'all know right away? <laughs> I still was thinking, what's the big deal? So he says, then he looks at me kind of incredulously and goes, you're letting a 13-year-old, your 13-year-old son drive a motor vehicle? Again, I'm thinking, it's a golf cart, dude. <laughs> but I didn't say that. And I said, well, I said, honestly, I said, I guess I, I should have known that. I said, I didn't think about it. I said, all week long, I've seen other kids driving golf carts. Everybody seems to drive them all over the island. I said, I didn't think anything about it. I said, but I understand now. I see what you're saying. He says, all right, we'll stay here. Well, he goes back to the, his ATV or whatever, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, golly, I mean, I, I, I realize at this point that we have broken the law, right? I mean, I'm not trying to deny that. It was unknowing, but I realized we'd broken the law. So I'm thinking, surely this happens all the time. You know, we, we, you know it's not like we were driving recklessly or anything. So I said, I, I, you know, I'm hoping that he's going to give us mercy in the form of a warning and not justice, right? So that's what I'm thinking. And so that's kind of holding out that hope. And so he comes back and uh, he gives Cooper a $170 ticket for driving in the bike lane. Then he pulls me aside and gives me this dad lecture and he gives me a summons to appear in court 30 days later. Yeah, seriously. I'm still thinking it's a golf cart, dude. <laughs> right? So, needless to say, I did not get mercy. I got justice, right? And so, and we're not quitters, so we, of course, did go to the donut shop. Um, <laughs> it turned out to be an expensive trip to the donut shop, but we did go. Now, so have you ever gotten mercy when you deserved justice, or the other way around, have you ever gotten justice when you deserved mercy? I mean, it's, you think about it, it's a very powerful experience to be on the receiving end of mercy, right? When you know you've blown it or failed somebody in some way or broken the law, and you expect the worst, and then somebody instead gives you mercy. It's powerful. And as awesome as it is to receive mercy, it's also kind of deeply ingrained in us as a society to always want to seek justice, like we know mercy is pretty transformative, but we all kind of default to wanting to see justice, right? We want criminals punished in a way that's proportionate to their crimes. We want evil dictators overthrown or done away with in some way. And our desire for justice also kind of makes its way into kind of smaller realms of life. So you think about in your relationships or in the workplace. You think about in sports and competition. We want to make sure that if people have cheated or lied or been selfish or greedy or they've hurt us or they've embarrassed us in some way or in any other way done something wrong to us, we want to make sure that they get <clears throat> what's coming to them. And the problem is, is that for every time they've done something wrong or made mistakes, so have we, right? But I always think it's kind of interesting that we always want mercy for ourselves and justice for everyone else. It just seems to be kind of the way that it plays out. And balancing justice and mercy is not something that we do well all the time. And if you could imagine how difficult it is for us to balance justice and mercy in our relationships with each other, imagine what it's like for God to balance justice and mercy as he deals with us. Well, today we're going to pick back up in this Elijah series. We've been doing a series of messages on the Old Testament prophet Elijah. And today we're going to zoom in on an account that I think just almost begs the, uh, the uh, kind of a further um, ex exploration of the idea of God's mercy and how he exercises it. So we've been tracking the mission of Elijah the prophet, and Elijah's basic assignment was 
to be a, um, kind of a voice of confrontation and judgment against King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who were some of the most vilest, corrupt, godless kings of Israel in the Old Testament. And so that was Elijah's assignment. And so you can imagine him confronting uh, the power structures of his day, how often that led to confrontation and put him in some pretty difficult situations. But God's been faithful to Elijah all along, and he's done some amazing things to protect him. He's done some amazing miracles through him. But just when you think Ahab and Jezebel can't be any more evil, they take it to another level. And today we're going to look at 1 Kings 21, where King Ahab just is adding to his resume of corruption and evil. So in 1 Kings 21, we're introduced to a man named Naboth. And Naboth lives next to the king's palace, and he owns a vineyard. And the king decides that he'd love to have Naboth's vineyard. So he goes trotting over there, and he gets in a conversation with Naboth. He's like, Naboth, I'd like to have your vineyard. And he says, so I'm either going to trade you for some other piece of land, if you find some other piece of land that I own you'd like, or I just want to buy it outright. Just name your price, and I'll buy it. Well, Naboth, for a lot of different reasons, part of it was that it was a, it, part of the land was an inheritance that the Lord had given to his family and his tribe when they took possession of the promised land. And God had said, don't ever, you can't ever permanently sell it. So Naboth declines the king and he says, I'm sorry, but I, I can't sell it to you. Well, Ahab goes home and he's pouting, right? He's just all upset and kind of down and he goes in and Jezebel says, hey, what's the deal? What's the problem? He's like, well, I wanted this piece of land, but Naboth won't sell it to me. And Jezebel basically says, you're the king. You don't take no for an answer. If you want that piece of land, you take it. And she says, just step back. Let me handle this. And so she then conspires. She comes up with this plot where she's going to make sure that Naboth in a very public setting is falsely accused of crimes that would deserve the death penalty. So she sets all that up. These people accuse him. He's then taken out and stoned to death. She then goes home and she tells Ahab, listen, Naboth's dead. Go take possession of the vineyard that you wanted. So it's coveting, it's conspiracy, it's murder. And then Elijah is called by God to deliver a message. So this is what he says. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And that's pretty swift and decisive judgment. I mean, it's, you can just get the sense like God's finally had enough. He's done. Ahab's evil has kind of reached this high watermark. And so God declares this final message of judgment on Ahab and Jezebel. And it is graphic and it is severe, but it's justified. Ahab had led people astray to worship these false gods. And every time... Elijah, God's prophet, confronts him. He then conspires more how he's going to hunt Elijah down and kill him. And then here he just kind of passively sits back as his wife conspires to falsely accuse Naboth and then have him killed to basically steal this vineyard. So Ahab and Jezebel deserved every bit of judgment that God pronounced on them, right? I mean, it is just case closed. Judgment finally pronounced. Ahab and Jezebel are going to get exactly what they deserve. But then I was shocked to read verse 27. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and fasted. And he lay in sackcloth and he went around meekly. He repented. For the first time, in all these times he's been confronted by Elijah with God's message of judgment, he has not altered the course. He's not been dismayed, dissuaded in any way from his path of evil. But for some reason now, 
He does. He tears his royal clothes. He puts on sackcloth and he fasts. These were all cultural expressions of humility in this day. Right? These were ways of, of humbling and bowing the knee before God and saying, I've been wrong and I'm confessing my wrong and I'm asking for mercy and I'm asking for forgiveness. That's what Ahab does. The most evil and godless king ever finally bows the knee and humbles himself. And I did not see that coming. Like if you're reading this straight for the first time, you never would predict that would happen. Ahab would repent. And as if that were not surprising enough, look what happens next. Verse 28, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Now, every other time the word of the Lord has come to Elijah, it's been a message of judgment. I mean, just consistently, every time it says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, it's always followed by a message of judgment. But not this time. This time it's a message of mercy. Now, it's a temporal mercy. We're not going to go into all that. It's not an ultimate kind of a, a salvation mercy, but it's a temporal mercy. And I wonder what Elijah's thinking at that moment. I don't wonder if he's thinking, really, God, have you not, do you, do you not remember all the evil, all the corruption, all the violent and murderous threats? Do you not remember Naboth's family who are still in shock and grief over what's just happened to him? Really, you're going to forgive? You're going to be merciful to him? And whether Elijah was thinking that or not, I sure was. Right? I mean, I'm thinking he deserves judgment. And when God begins to pronounce the whole, you know, dogs licking up your blood and dogs devouring Jezebel out in the desert, I'm thinking, absolutely. They're getting what they deserve. I didn't like it. And so as I kind of reflected on that, I thought, if that was, if that was just my knee-jerk reaction... I wonder how many other people would probably feel the same way at times. And so I just made me think about, I wonder if there's, there's probably two things that are, are kind of things we all need to remember as we think about not only reflecting on Ahab and God's mercy to Ahab, but just in general about our capacity for mercy. Two things. The first one is this, God leans towards mercy. Listen to what God said about himself to Moses in Exodus 34. He passed in front of Moses and then he says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So as God passes in front of Moses and he wants to self-disclose, he wants to say, Moses, this is what I'm like. If you could read and see my heart, this is, these are the characteristics that drive me. He lists those, compassionate, abounding in love and faithful, maintaining love. But then he says, if you want to know what's just true about me, I'm forgiving. I forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so Elijah is watching as God's character is displayed in real life. You see, God's bent towards mercy. He, he leans in that direction. Now, of course, he's just and he's holy and he's always opposed to sin, and he takes sin very seriously, as demonstrated by his declaration of judgment on Ahab and Jezebel. But when a person humbly acknowledges their sin, and they turn to him, he always responds in mercy. Always. He, he, he's just bent in that direction. He leans towards mercy. That's just what's true about God. We're never beyond the reach of God's mercy and grace. If Ahab's repentance could trigger God's mercy, then there's hope for all of us, right? I mean, you think about that. Of all the evil and all the corruption, all it took was Ahab finally bows the knee and he humbles himself and he repents. And it's as if that just triggers in God. This, this, it just compels him to be merciful. And that should give hope to all of us. Aren't you glad that God's bent towards mercy? If you know yourself as well as I know me, I'm so grateful that God's merciful. We all should be. It's just true of who he is. The problem is sometimes I think we can, we, we can forget that. Or maybe we just, we have such misconceptions about God. 
right? In fact, there may be some of you in here, you just say, you know what? Um, I mean, I've heard the whole God is love thing or whatever, and God's forgiving, but, but you don't know me. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know how far things have gone or how long I've strayed, or you don't know the things I'm ashamed of. You don't know the things that I regret. It's just, I, I, I'm, I'm beyond it. I'm too far gone. God's merciful, but I, I mean, I've, I, I've gone beyond the boundaries of God's mercy. There's just no way. I mean, here's the deal. There's no accident that you're here today or that you're listening online, right? Because you need to be reminded of this truth today, that God's bent towards mercy. He leans towards mercy. And the only thing separating you from a personal experience of God's mercy is not the severity of your sin or how long you've run from God or avoided God. The only thing that's separating you is just bowing the knee and just humbling yourself and just asking for his mercy, and it's available to anyone who will turn to him. So God leans towards mercy. That's the first thing we need to remember. That kind of leads to the second one, which is a follow-up question. God leans towards mercy. How about us? Are you a merciful person? Do you extend grace and patience to others in a way that reflects the character of your heavenly Father? So the second point is how merciful we are towards others will be directly related to how aware we are of God's mercy towards us. That's what we have to remember. How merciful we are towards others will be directly related to how aware we are of God's mercy towards us. This is so clearly lived out and demonstrated, but also taught by Jesus. In Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus and he's like, hey, Jesus, listen. I get you're preaching the whole forgiveness thing, but there's got to be some limit, right? So like, how many times do I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And Jesus answers him 40, I'm 70 times seven, right? And people talk about how basically Jesus' answer is kind of a mathematical way of saying there is no limit. He takes a perfect number and he doubles. He's basically saying it's eternal. There is no limit. And just to kind of reinforce the point of what he's getting at in Peter's heart, who wants to restrain or restrict forgiveness and mercy Jesus says, hey, you know, here's a parable. There's this master, and one of his servants owed him a ton of money. And he goes to his servant, he says, listen, it's time to pay your debt. And the servant says, I don't don't have it. And the master says, well, then I'm going to throw you in prison, and I'm going to sell off your family and your servants and all your possessions to pay back the debt. And the guy drops to his knees, and he's like, he just begs. He's like, listen, I, I can't pay you back, and I'm just pleading, please be merciful. And the master says, you know what? I'm going, to forgive your, I'm going to forgive your debt completely. And The guy gets up and he goes outside. And it says while he's on his way home, he bumps into another guy who owes him almost nothing. So if, the, so if he owed the original master a million dollars, he goes to a guy that owed him $10. And he says, listen, it's time. You need to pay me back that money you owe me. And the guy's like, listen, I, I don't have it right now. You know, could you just be merciful to me? And the guy's like, no way, man. I'm throwing you in prison, I'm selling off your stuff, and I'm getting my money back. Well, some of the other servants hear this guy do this, the forgiven servant, what he'd done, he'd go back to the master and they tell him, and he has that guy pulled back and he says, are you kidding me? I forgave you this mountainous debt, and you go out and you're demanding this tiny little debt be repaid, I showed you forgiveness and mercy, and you're going to go now demand justice from somebody else? throws him in prison. And he basically, Jesus then says, if you don't forgive your brother or sister from the heart, then this is how your heavenly father is going to relate to you. Because it means you don't know forgiveness and mercy. Because there's this connection, this undeniable connection between our experience of mercy and our being a dispenser of mercy. As C.S. Lewis put it, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. If we can live with that kind of awareness of God's mercy, then we're going to be humble, we're going to be grateful, and we're going to be compelled to extend that kind of mercy to others. And if we practice that, then we'll be conduits of mercy. And it can be in response to big things. It can be in response to small things. Like, for example, choosing to show your forgetful or unfriendly server at a restaurant mercy. 
right? That's a normal, that's a common experience. So you're eating somewhere with your family or your date or your spouse or somebody and the server just kind of forgets things, didn't get your order right or they seem kind of flustered or they're a little short with you, don't seem as polite or as friendly as you think. There's an opportunity to show mercy because maybe they're struggling with something that you have no clue about, right? Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's a, a, a cancer diagnosis that they just found out about. Maybe they just lost somebody that they loved, right? So instead of not tipping or complaining to the manager, maybe it's an opportunity just to exercise patience, right? To, maybe it's an opportunity to double your tip, to be merciful. To say, I don't know what they're struggling with, but man, it's obviously got them kind of in a funk. Maybe this is an opportunity instead of demanding, well, I'm entitled, I'm paying for a good meal and I deserve, you don't deserve squat. In heaven's economy, what you deserve, you didn't get. Instead, you got mercy. And then God releases you into the world to say, now go be a dispenser of that mercy to people. That's what we're called to. Or maybe it's extending mercy to a spouse or to your kids or to your parents when, when we overreact or we say something that's kind of out of character or we forget something or we fail in some way. Right? It's not saying you necessarily ignore the issue, but instead of being immediately offended and just kind of reciprocating with anger or retaliation, maybe you just decide, you know what, I'm going to extend mercy here. I'm going to choose to move towards this person. I'm going to try to disarm this situation and maybe just see, maybe there's something going on. Maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they're scared about something I don't even know about. Or maybe they're hurt in some way. So I'm just going to put me and my offense aside. I'm just going to say, you know what? What would mercy do here? How do I move towards them in mercy? Or maybe it's when you see a single parent struggling with several kids and it just seemed kind of be out of control. So you're in the shopping center or the Publix or something, and you see this mom or this dad with several kids, and they're just bouncing off the walls and kind of freaking out and screaming and grabbing stuff, whatever, right? You've been there, right? You either are those people or you've seen those people. For us, we've been both, right? So we get that. But when you're there, it's, it's an opportunity because you could either go one of two ways. You could either pridefully judge them and assume that they just don't have the parenting expertise that you have, right? So you're already imagining in your mind, well, if they would do this, and if they did that like I did this, and if that would jerk that kid up, and I did da 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 whatever, right? You're just feeding the prideful that you're like parent of the year. You could either go that route, or you could just say, you know what? I'm just going to be merciful. I have no idea what that mom's going through. I have no idea what those kids have been through. Maybe they're foster kids. Maybe she's just doing the best she can. Maybe her husband just went off to, you know, across the world in the military or something, and she's there by herself, right? It doesn't matter what the if or what the possible explanation is. It's an opportunity just to show mercy. So maybe you just offer a word of kindness. You know, maybe you kind of disarm the tension that other people are feeling in the line by just saying something like, you know what, boy, I've been there. I get that. You got your hands full, don't you? Hang in there. You're doing a good job. Right? Or maybe you just go, maybe just go radical and say, can I help in some way? Can I help you out to the car with your groceries or something? Or, you know, I don't know. I'm just saying it. Just th those are just those kind of everyday opportunities to offer mercy to people everywhere. They're always going to be out there. Right? And here's another one. Many of you are going to be getting together with your extended family this week for Thanksgiving, right? A lot of opportunities to extend mercy and patience. <laughs> are coming your way, right? This is providentially designed by God to have this message right before you go in with Uncle Billy or Aunt whatever. Because, um, you know, because families are always, it doesn't matter how pretty you look on the outside, all families are made up of goofy, weird people, right? And, and they're going to be irritating in certain ways. And, and you know, off, even off the lighter note, and a more serious note, there's some real deep hurt that exists in families. There's unhealed um, you know, all kind of uh, arguments and past hurts sometimes. And sometimes these family holiday things are just tough because of that. But they're, they're kind of perfectly suited opportunities for you to practice mercy. How do you practice mercy? How will you do that? When we forget God's mercy towards us, our compassion is blocked. And we lack patience and grace and mercy 
for others. And usually what blocks our mercy is pride and judgment. I was reading this uh, book called Dangerous Wonder by Mike Iaconelli, and in it he tells a story of um, he and his wife uh, were young life counselors for a time in their life, and so they worked with um, troubled teens. And this one kid um, in particular his, was from a really broken family. His dad was an alcoholic and was very abusive to him and his siblings and to his, his mother. And so during this two-year time period, Mike and his wife just really loved on this kid spent extra time with him, showed up to his sporting events, that they kind of became a stable, uh, kind of almost like a parent uh, replacement in a sense for a couple years while they were going through this tough time. Kid graduates and they've kind of lost touch with him. It's probably six or eight years later, they buy a bunch of tile and they're going to retile uh, part of their house. And they asked the tile company that they bought the tile from and they're in this real tiny town out in the Midwest. And they said, do you know anybody who could lay the tile for us? And they said, well, there's, there's, there's two or three, but there are two of them are really tied up in these big jobs for months, and there's only one guy that's available who could do this work. And when they tells him the name, they immediately remember, it's this, this kid's father. And immediately he's like, there's no way I'm hiring that guy. He's an alcoholic, he's abusive, and he's probably some thief, he'll probably steal from us, or try to cheat from us in some way. And the lady said, well, I don't know what to tell you, he's the only guy. And he's like, all right, we're fine. Line him up. And he decides, goes home and tells his wife, he's like, you know, that, we're going to have to hire this guy, and, you know, he's probably going to do shoddy work, and, you know, he's probably going to try and cheat us in some way, but I'm going to keep my eyes on him. I'm going to be watching him like a hawk. He's not taking advantage of us. So the guy comes and does about two and a half days worth of work, gets to the end of the third day, is about to be finished, and Mike walks out and says, uh, you know, it looks good, and he says, uh, he just come by my office when you're done, my home office, um, just come uh, in there, and I'll, I'll settle up with you. And the guy said, yeah, I, d I need to talk with you about the money. And here, you know, Mike's like, oh, here we go, right? This is where he's going to try and cheat me out of more money. He's going to say it was more than he thought. He's going to have to, so he goes and kind of rants to his wife, and he's like, listen, this guy's, this is where he's going to try and cheat us. And when he comes in here, I'm going to give him what for. He is not taking advantage of us. He goes, I'm going to leave the door cracked so you can hear me give it to him. And so a couple hours goes by, and this guy walks in, and he says, um, he says, John, I want to talk to you about the, 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 the final bill. He says, you know, he goes, several years back, he says, I, he goes, I'm an alcoholic. And he goes, several years back, I was at the lowest point in my life, and he says, I was, I was treating my family really, really badly, and he goes, it was just, it was horrible. And, um, and he says, and I know during that time, you and your wife were very kind to my son, and you loved him. And uh, he said, about six months later, he says, I finally went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, I've been sober for six years. He said, but you know, I look back and I, I realized that had you not been an anchor for my son, I probably would have lost relationship with him forever. But because he had you in his life, he kind of held on. And when I got sober, we've had a chance now to restore our relationship. And he says, I, 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 we have a relationship today because of what you did. And he says, I've never had the chance to thank you, but I want to thank you now. And so he then hands Mike a $350 bill with the words paid in full across it. And he walks out. And Mike just says, it was one of those moments where he just thought, why, how quickly we forget mercy. How quickly we forget that God can change and transform people. Instead, pride and presumption are always going to block our mercy. Last I checked, we're all more or less broken people, right? With flaws and shortcomings, selfishness and insecurity, and we're all just doing the best we can with what we have, right? Some of you clean up a little better than others, and you look like you have it all together, but we know better, right? So it's time to drop the self-righteousness and offer each other the same kind of patience and mercy that God's offered us. Elijah had a front row seat to God's mercy, showing up in a surprising way to a surprising character, Ahab. But to say that God's bent towards mercy is not to say that mercy is not serious or that it's not a costly choice. Every act of mercy means that the one extending mercy absorbs the cost and the pain of the offender as an act of love. And the ultimate act of mercy was the cross of Jesus Christ. For God to give us mercy... He had to give Jesus what we deserved, which was humiliation and death. And there's no greater demonstration of God's love for you and me than that. So do you need mercy? 
good news is God leans towards mercy. All it takes is a humble acknowledgement and you ask for mercy and it will be yours and it will flood your life and change everything. You need more mercy as you relate to maybe a particular person in your life that came to mind as soon as we start talking about this. Or maybe you just wish you had more mercy in general for people. Then Jesus also shows us the way, just says, take some time and reflect on the mercy that's been shown to you and then ask God to fill you with that kind of mercy for others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for what was so undeserved for us, which was mercy. We've all forfeited and blown any rights or entitlements to your love and forgiveness. All of us. And it's amazing that you still went to the lengths that you did by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. He would take all of our sin and our guilt and our selfishness and our pettiness and our self-righteousness, and he would take that to the cross. You would punish him for it so that you could extend mercy and forgiveness and grace to us. Pray that that mercy would change us on a daily basis to be people who are receivers of mercy, but also people who are dispensers of mercy. Help us to do this in Jesus' name.
As people who have received incredible mercy, let's leave here so that we can be dispensers of that mercy to a world that desperately needs it. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving.